And so before we introduce our next holy habit, I want to ask you a question. You may have noticed the, the very subtle tent on the platform. Anybody like camping? So hand right up, Heather, I know you love camping. A few other people love camping. I really admire you, I do, honestly. Um, camping, I'll be honest with you, I'm a bit of a diva. It's not my thing, all right? If, if you love camping, God bless you. I, think, I genuinely think that's amazing. If you're outdoorsy in that way, I think that's class, but it's just not me, right? I'm a diva, I need the caravan at least, right? And so what happened, it all, it all goes back to my Duke of Edinburgh. When I was at school, we did a, an expedition. Well, an expedition's a bit of a big word for it. But we went to County Wicklow, the Wicklow Hills. And that was where our Duke of Edinburgh expedition was going to be. And let me tell you, in some ways it was brilliant. And in other ways, it was a complete and utter disaster. See the feeling of walking miles every day. In fact, there was one lad in our group, you know, get you get somebody who's very confident in the group. And he says, no, we're going this way. We know where we're going. And about an hour in, I looked at him and said, Sam, you have no clue where we are. And he goes, nope. <laughs> and what happens is you walk for miles. By the end of the night, you're knackered. You've got blisters on your feet and it's windy and it's raining and you're trying to fight with this tent to get it up. And as the night is beginning to come in. And then what happens is the midges, all the midges of County Wicklow looked at us and they thought, we're having an all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> We got bitten left, right, and center. And you know what it's like? You get into the tent and then water gets into it and it's minging and you're thinking, why have I done this? And then as it gets in the night, maybe this has happened to you if you've ever stayed in a tent, whether it's been at camp or whether it's been Duke of Edinburgh. You get into the tent for the night. By the way, there were three or four lads in our tent, which was cozy, but stinky. You get into the tent for the night. You get all warm and cozy. You zip up your sleeping bag and you think, ah, finally, warm and dry. And then you think, I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> and you have to get out and go to the loo. I don't know about you, church. Camping is not my thing. Tents are not my thing. But this morning, before we introduce our next holy habit, I want to introduce you to the idea of spending time in the tent. In fact, we've called this message, Time in the Tent. So let's go to God's Word. If you have your Bible with you, we're going to Exodus chapter 33, verses 7 to 11. And it says this. This is, by the way, if you've if you're new to church, new to faith, exploring faith, this is a, a moment uh, between Moses and God. Uh, they have just left slavery in Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. And this is what happens. Verse 7. It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand at the entrances of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. As he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent. Now I want to pause there briefly. Again, if you're new to church, you're exploring faith. The, 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 the pillar of cloud was the symbol, was the realization that God's presence was there with, moment, with Moses in that moment. That the Lord himself was there. That's what that means. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses. Listen to this. As one speaks to a friend. Afterwards, Moses would return to the camp. And we're going to read that next bit in just a wee second. To give you an explanation here, church, as we said, the people of Israel are between slavery and in Egypt and their promised land. And God, by that pillar of cloud and fire, would accompany his very presence with God's people through the wilderness and the all that he had promised them. And yet we see this moment that when Moses would need to meet with God, he set up this thing called the tent of meeting. Now, if you've been in, in church for a while, it's not the tabernacle because the tabernacle has not been set up and dedicated yet. This is different. 
The tent of meeting was where Moses would meet with God. He took time in the tent. But watch this, church, these next couple of verses. But the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. When Moses would get what he needed to hear from God, he would go back to God's people. He would go back to the camp. But Joshua, this young lad, wanted to spend time in the tent. I wonder, did Joshua realize that the longer he spent in the tent, the more time he had with the God who loved them? There was something about God's presence in that tent that Joshua didn't want to rush away. Joshua wanted to stay in the tent of meeting. And church, this morning, I want to ask us a question. Do you have a tent to meet? with God. Thankfully, not a physical tent stuck on the side of a Wicklow Hill somewhere, but a place that you can be with Jesus. See, church, don't lose sight of what holy habits are all about. Don't lose sight of why we're looking at the spiritual disciplines. It's not that we would be high-performing Christians, that we would be able to tick the box throughout our day and throughout our week. I've read my Bible. I've spent a wee bit of quiet time with the Lord. I've maybe sung some worship songs. I've, I've, I've been to the prayer night. I've, I've been to connect, whatever it is. And we tick the boxes and we think, yeah, I, I'm doing well. And church, if we think that's what holy habits are about, we've missed the greatest joy of it all. Church, holy habits, spiritual disciplines are all about getting us to a place where we just want to spend time in the tent, where we just want to spend time with Jesus. Fasting, first and foremost, is about time with Jesus. Prayer, first and foremost, is about time in the tent with Jesus. And our third holy habit we're going to look at, church, is the holy habit of silence and solitude, which don't miss this is all about time in the tent with Jesus. Just now we're going to come, if you want to read with me, in Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 31. And it's a moment where, church, uh, we see this discipline, this holy habit, Jesus doing just the same. And maybe you've seen some of these holy habits and uh, you think to yourself, oh, that's not really for me. I I don't want to do that, right? And don't get me wrong, we can all approach holy habits differently depending on your stage of life. But I just want to remind you of this, church, right? To be a disciple of Jesus is to follow the disciplines of Jesus. And we cannot be disciples without discipline, right? And so if we want to follow Jesus and know him more, church, which is God's heart for you, we've got to follow in the Lord's footsteps. Everybody okay? Good. You with me? Good. Nobody asleep? We're all good. Okay. We're all good. Right. So Mark chapter 6, verse 30, it says this. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. Now, what do you say, church? Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a what? A quiet place and rest a while. He said this because the disciples Because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. And so what we see, church, in the midst of Jesus and the disciples' busy schedule and their busy lives, he says, come on with me for a second to a quiet place. This isn't the first time the Lord does this. In fact, there's eight other occasions in the Gospels that we at least know of where Jesus went to a quiet place a lonely place to be with God. If you like, Jesus knew when it was time to take time in the tent. Going off by ourselves is solitude. A quiet place is all about silence. In other words, church, here's the holy habit. In our time with God, whether it's our prayer time or our worship time, do we make a habit of doing what Jesus did. Finding solitude 
to the best that we can and finding silence. Silence is a holy habit. Because you say, what are you doing? Stop it, I'm trying to preach. Just stop it, right? Silence is a holy habit. And I want to... What are you doing? Do you knock out in the head? I'm trying to preach. Let, let, me read you, let me read you a verse from 1 Kings. 1 Kings 19. I'm trying to hurry me up. That's what you said there. He's not wearing a mic. That's what he said. Church, listen, listen to the word of the Lord. So just silence our hearts for a second, right? If you want to close your eyes and bow your head, I want to read you this scripture and listen to the voice of the Lord. First Kings 19 says, Go and stand out on the mountain, the Lord told him. As Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. Everybody get that okay? Okay, okay. We'll, we'll read on, we'll read on. It was such a terrible blast that after the wind was there and after the earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the fire, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And there after that, there was a gentle whisper. And the Lord will bless the public reading of his word. <laughs> I don't think we need to illustrate this any further, do you? <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much. Do you want to give him a hand? Give him a hand. Church, how are you and I supposed to hear that voice of our Heavenly Father? To truly spend time with the Lord Jesus if we are constantly surrounded by the drumbeat of busyness, by the symbols of constant noise. How are we supposed to hear the Lord? He wants you to hear his voice today, but we gotta know when to find the silence. Here's the scripture I was trying to read before I was rudely interrupted. Kings 19 verse 11, it's a, a moment with Elijah, the prophet Elijah and the Lord. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty wind storm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. Church, in our world today, we are so surrounded by noise. We have lost the discipline, the holy habit of silence to hear the gentle whisper. And when we talk about the gentle whisper, church, we don't necessarily mean God speaking to us audibly. What we mean is silence in our hearts, that the holy, we would know the Holy Spirit speaking to our spirit by the Holy Spirit himself and through speaking to us through his word. And if you're thinking, Jordan, maybe you've wee ones and you're going, Jordan, good luck finding silence in our house. And, and I, maybe, maybe the way your life is at the minute, silence is hard to come by. But keep this in mind, church. Silence is not just about the noise around us. It's not just the absence of talking. Silence is the art of listening. And so maybe you do have wee ones in the background or you have, you have busyness going on in, in, in another part of your life or you have noisy neighbours or whatever it is. That, that's okay. But we can still find silence in that by turning our hearts to listen to the Lord. Do you know it's the enemy's tactic to keep the world as busy as possible for you and I? C.S. Lewis uh, wrote a book called The Screw Tape Letters, and, and if you don't know it, basically it's a, it's a fictional story as C.S. Lewis does to prove a spiritual point. And in the story, there's a junior demon who's writing to a senior, more experienced demon, demon about how to keep God's people away from God. And as the junior demon is writing, the senior uh, demon replies to him, Uncle Screwtape, and he says this. He says this. Our plan is to create so much noise in the world that man can no longer hear the voice of his God. 
Our plan is to create so much noise in the world that man can no longer hear the voice of his God. Church, he wrote that over 80 years ago. And if you think about our world today, we have outsourced what people call dead space, silence. Do you remember when you used to get bored? Remember those days? And you used your imagination for things? That's all gone because we are outsourcing boredom. We're outsourcing dead space. Even silence and solitude has been lost to mostly the screen, to music, and to entertainment. You and I can never be bored. There's always something to watch, listen to, or do. And in our world, we are filled with things to keep us busy, with noise and a continuous stream of things to look at and things to listen to. And church, this holy habit, this will help us stand out from our world. Our holy habit, church, is to know when to shut it all off and to be silent before God. Some of you know this story, but I, I love it and I, I think it's appropriate for today. But if you haven't heard it, it, it goes like this. There was a story of a group of men um, who were working on building a, an ice house in the 1700s, early 1700s before electric was around. And as they're building this ice house that basically uses the fridge freezer, it begins to get dark. And this group of men, they're, they're working away. And, and one of the men actually has his, his young son with him. And he says to him, come on, we'll go and we'll go back home. The light's starting to go. And we'll come back and finish the ice house off in the morning. But as they're beginning to leave, the man's watch slips off his wrist and falls into the sawdust of the ice house. And they try to look for it, but as I said, it's getting dark and they can't seem to see it. And they think, you know what, we'll give up and we'll, we'll look for it in the morning. Come on. And they all leave to go home. But as they're on the way home, the wee boy stays behind. If you like, he stays in the tent. He slips into the ice house when everybody's gone. And within seconds, he's back out with the watch in his hand. And all these men gather around and they say, how did you find that watch? so quickly in the dark and the wee boy said oh it was easy I just had to lie back be silent and listen for the ticking there are some seasons in life church where we will only hear the guidance the voice of the Lord when we're silent enough to hear the ticking Silence is a holy habit. And maybe we're thinking this morning, well, where in my life can I find silence? And church, it's actually dead practical. There's two ways, two things that we really need to do to begin to find silence in our hearts. The first is this, knowing about the external noise and distractions. And sometimes, folks, we just need to know when to turn things off to spend time with God genuinely. And, and I did this thing of, you know, uh, silence in my phone, doesn't work. Sometimes, maybe you're a bit like me, I'm learning that sometimes I have to turn my phone off and set it out of the room if I'm gonna spend any time in the tent. Sometimes we just need to be practical. Maybe, maybe it's not using Spotify all the time for worship music. I love using worship music in my quiet time with God, but sometimes there's a time for silence, church or Apple music or CDs or cassettes or whatever you're on. Sometimes we need to know when to just switch off and log out of social media. Sometimes we need to know when to not have any notifications for email or for work and carve out that time for time in the tent and to be silent with Jesus. Maybe we need to go somewhere. Maybe you have a room in the house that you can say, this is a room I'm going to for quiet. Maybe you have a chair. Maybe you have wee ones and, and you, can't, you can't go to another room. You need to look after them. Maybe uh, you're caring for somebody who's ill in your family. Is there even a chair that you can go to to say, Lord, when I'm in this chair, I'm being silent in my heart with you. Lots of practical things, places we can go, things we can do. What do you need to do this morning, church, beginning today to carve out silence for Jesus? And then there's the more difficult one. That's finding silence internally. And I really struggle with that. And maybe you do too. Because here's often, church, how my quiet time will look like. And maybe, maybe it looks the same for you. Maybe you begin to still your heart. In fact, I'll tell you about what happened to me. At the, the beginning of last summer, I went to a, 
um, a prayer place, which is a prayer retreat place, which is open for, for leaders to go to. And I, it's really spiritual until I realize that they have a vow of silence, which means you're not allowed to talk, right? And so I rocked up and, and I was sitting in, in the wee uh, kind of prayer church space that they have. And if you like, I thought, I'm going to go into my tent and spend time with Jesus. And I'm going to be silent probably for the first time in my life, as Chloe will attest to you. So into the tent I went, time with Jesus. And I thought to myself, finally, silence. Time in the tent. And I would just sit there and I'd say, Lord, I'm just being still and silent to hear your voice. Oh, I forgot to put the pins out. I better text Chloe back. Sorry, sorry, Lord, sorry, sorry, silence, silence. You know, I just had an idea for a sermon. I'll maybe, I'll maybe, no, actually, no, 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 silence. Our God is an awesome God, he did from heaven above it. Oh, no, no, sorry, sorry, Lord, sorry, sorry, silence. Just making sure you're still there. What begins to happen, church? Maybe you're like me. Finding silence internally can be really, really difficult. Because maybe your world can stop, but this doesn't stop, does it? This doesn't stop. And so the challenge to make silence a holy habit is getting this to be still and getting this to be still. And don't get me wrong, we're human. Of course we're going to think. But church, this is just dead practical. See, when you're trying to spend time with Jesus and be silent with him. Every time your mind wanders, that's okay. Just bring it back to him and say, Lord, I still my heart again, and again, and again, and again, as often as we need to. Remember Gareth with the, the weights? It's a progression. We'll learn to be silent as we go. Maybe for you this week, and I want to set us a challenge. Maybe for you this week, it's taking one minute a day to be silent before God. Then go to five minutes a day to be silent before God. And before you know it, silence will become a holy habit where you can spend 10 minutes, even more, just being quiet, silent, to hear his voice. I remember one preacher saying, sometimes when we go to pray with the Lord, we just need to shut up. But I wouldn't say that to you because that's rude. But we do. Sometimes we need to know when to come before the Lord and to be still and to make this psalm, Psalm 62 and 5, this is what it says, to make it our prayer. Let all that I am wait what? Quietly before God for my hope is in him. Quietness, church, is a holy habit. Where in your week can you make silence a holy habit? And so, church, to bring this all together this morning as we close, I don't want us to lose sight about why we're doing these holy habits. Remember, holy habits is all about time in the tent that you and I would know Jesus because church, there's nothing like knowing Jesus personally. You can know about God, but then there's no one God. When I was in Bible college, part of our, our placement was to do visitation. And me and my friend who was, was in my class, we would, would do visits on a Friday around our, our home church at the time. And there was one wee lady we were sent to called Mrs. McCartney. Mrs. McCartney was brilliant. Do you ever, you ever meet somebody and there's just like a godliness on them? Do you know what I'm talking about? And we'd wrap the door and she says, oh, glad it's good to see you. Come on in. And, and we went in and, and her Bible was sitting open in her living room. She lived alone. She was a, an elderly lady. I think, I think she near, I'm nearly sure she lived past 100. But this elderly lady that we would be, we would be visiting, she would say, oh, I was, just, I was just reading the Bible this morning, reading about Moses and the Exodus. And, you know, it's a visitation. You get into conversation with her. You know, how you doing? How's your health? How's the weather? And as my friend was talking to her church, about 15 minutes into the conversation, it just dawned on me. It was, it was the most incredible thing. 
as we were talking, I realized the Lord Jesus is in this room. Just as we were talking about regular things with this lady, the presence of God was resting in her living room. Many of you will know what I'm talking about. The sense of God's presence was there. There was no worship team. There was no pastor to preach. There was no conference. It was our living room. And I think back to that moment sometimes and I wonder, what was it about her living room of all places that we could walk in and know that God was in there? I think it was because her living room became her tent of meeting. Her living room became the place where she could open God's word and be silent and still and know his presence near to her. Church holy habits are all about going to the tent of meeting to be with Jesus. And may we never, ever lose sight of that. See, church, the Lord's heart for you this morning is not that we would be employees for him who do things in the kingdom. The Lord's heart this morning is not that we would always come to him asking for things because, church, he wants us to be our, his sons and his daughters, not his clients. He's our father and our friend, not the genie in the bottle. And church, the whole point of this series in these coming weeks is that you and I would know personally how to draw close to the one who loves us, who knows every thought in our mind, who knows our past, present and future and loves us all the same, the one who died for us and who rose again, this Jesus who you and I know. And if you don't know him this morning, he invites you to know him this morning, that every time and every minute we get, we would be a people of holy habits who know the Holy One personally. It's all about knowing Jesus. I remember hearing the story of uh, my uncle and, and his granda, my great granda, who I'm, I'm named after. And here would be the routine in, in their house, was that every Saturday, my uncle would run in when he was a wee boy. He would say, hi, dear granda, how you doing? And Granda would give him the pocket money and say, thanks, Granda. And he would run out the door. Next Saturday, hiya, Granda. You doing okay, son? Pocket money. See you later. Out the door to play football. Saturday after Saturday, that was the routine. Hi, Granda. Pocket money. Out you go. And then there was one day he ran in. He got the pocket money. He says, thanks, Granda. And he turned to go. And Granda Thomas said, son, would you not sit with me for a while? This morning the Lord just wants you to sit with him for a while. Holy habits are all about sitting with Jesus and knowing him. The Lord isn't wanting employees. He wants friends and servants. And this morning, you and I are called to be his friend and his servants. Daniel says, those who know their God will do great exploits. But the point of it all is knowing God. And so this morning, church, I finish on this question. Where this week will you find silence to sit and know Jesus? Where this week will you make time for the tent?